a good feeling. Twix, it gives me such a good, good feeling. Good, good cookie, good, good caramel. Good, good chocolatey coating. Twix is made to feel good about. It's a good, good feeling. A Twix, it feels so good, it feels so fine. A mixture of cloud showers and some sunshine forecast for tomorrow across the province. Looking at our satellite photo, it shows a cool, unstable air mass bringing clouds and showers across the interior tomorrow. On the south coast, the same system will produce clouds with showers and some thunder showers near the mountains. Looking at the forecasts and beginning in the far north, cloudy, lows of minus 12 and highs of 5. Sunny with cloudy periods, rain or snow in the interior, lows of minus 4 and highs of 14. And on the south, south coast, cloudy with sunny periods, showers, lows of 3, and highs of 12 degrees. That's the early news. I'll be back at 6 for tonight's news hour. Stay tuned. Jack and his guests coming up on Webster. <laughs> Sugar Ray Leonard's fight with marvelous Marvin Hagler. It's here Sunday at 4.30. Good evening on this holiday Friday, Best of Webster's about sex, sin and chess. On sex, the Mayflower Madame. On sin, Kitty Kelly and her Sinatra book. And on chess, Tuzi Davinsky. Now here's Ted with the rundown. He's known to UBC math students as doctor or professor. But in the UK, he's a darling of the British press. Tonight, Webster matches wits with one of the world's foremost authorities on chess. Professor Nathan Davinsky. Old Blue Eyes has always had things his way, and that's the title of the latest biography about Frank Sinatra. Coming up, Webster chats with author Kitty Kelly. But first, her roots trace back to passengers on the Mayflower, but she chose an even older profession. Sidney Biddlebarrows made headlines and heads turn as a Mayflower madam and as author of a book of the same title. With her scintillating stories, She's up first with Webster. I start with a grim face. Prostitution in Vancouver means drugs, pimps, disease, political squabbles, red light districts, and of course the great glory of the city of Vancouver these days is that the city council, to try and keep them shepherded into certain corners of the city, puts up traffic barriers so that the girls won't bother the local neighborhoods. Now what am I going to do now? Look upon this glamorous society woman. Her name is Sydney Biddle Barrows. What a wonderful name. Sydney Biddle Barrows, who run, ran until she finally got nailed by the police. A prostitution ring. Is that right? You ran a prostitution ring, madam, didn't you? Call girl business. A call girl business. What is the difference, please, between the call girl business and the prostitution ring? Well, it's actually a very technical one, and a lot of people do feel that it's splitting hairs. But with an escort service or with a call girl, the client pays for the young lady's time. He doesn't pay any more or any less, depending on what he does or does not do with that time. Prostitution is the exchange of a specific amount of money for a specific sexual act. I do realize it's hair splitting, but we are talking about the technicality of the law as opposed to the spirit of the law. And it's not possible to arrest and convict somebody only on the spirit of the law. In other words, you were arrested and convicted on the letter of the law and that you were supplying females for the purpose of sexual intercourse one way or another well I was arrested under that uh, premise but I was never convicted under that premise but this program won't make sense unless we draw attention to you yourself now did you ever work as one of the girls no I didn't a lot of people you know think that anyone who does what she did absolutely must have done well one might have thought you would fill in on a bad night when all your best girls were out uh... then who would answer the phones so you just answered the phones? Yes. But what's different about you, Sil Sidney Biddle Barrows, and the average man in the big hat with a fancy suit who stands in the corner taking the receipts from the girls? What's your social background is the difference? Oh, plus I think I'm far more attractive and interesting. No, I think I ran a business. I think what, what these... No, 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 no. I want to get back to the name of your book, which you're <laughs> flogging now and the experiences of your somewhat degrading occupation. 
uh, The Mayflower Madam. Why did, they call, why did you call your book The Mayflower Madam? Well, the New York Post dubbed me The Mayflower Madam because my ancestors came over on the Mayflower. You gotta be joking. No, I'm kidding, both sides of the family. The Mayflower was the first boat, the first settlers that came over to the United States to, uh, to settle in the new country, and I'm descended on both sides from two of those Biddle. people. Biddle, that seems a very prominent American name. Yes, it's a, they're a very prominent Philadelphia family. And how many generations was, was it before they lost their sense of old-fashioned moral values and started a, an escort service? Well, gee, I guess it's been an awfully long time. Well, many. <laughs> when was the Mayflower? I think it was 15 generations ago, somebody told me. I'm not exactly sure. And is it not a fact that you were the first Biddle Battles to be um, hauled into the local tank? Oh, no, not at all. There are many of us have been arrested well, for many different things before. However, I am the only one who did this. The only one arrested for a morals offense. I think so. I think, right now. What were you doing before you decided to get into the get-rich-quick racket of selling sex for cash? Well, I was working in the fashion business, and I got fired because I refused to participate in the kickback scheme. Uh -huh. I did not think that that was the sort of thing that someone like me wanted to be doing. Uh -huh. I thought it was very dishonest. So I was fired, and there I was on unemployment, and a friend of mine, who was also unemployed at the time, was answering the phones for an escort service. Now, I had no clue as to what an escort service was, and she told me all about it, and I thought, that doesn't sound so bad. She was making $50 a night off the books, which in 1978 was a lot of money. You it's mean, not bad it, today. Actually, Yes. Mm. And uh, I said, well, I think a lot of people in my unemployed position would have said, gee, if they ever have any openings, let me know. Well, several weeks later, she rang me up and said, one of the girls in the office is leaving. Are you still interested in answering the phones? Well, all of a sudden, I said, no, I don't think so. You know, I thought I was afraid of getting arrested. I was afraid of the mafia. I didn't think it was the kind of thing Could you knew it was a doing. call get operation? Oh, of course, of course. So, uh, to make a long story short, I went over and met the person who ran it, just because I was curious as to what kind of person this person could possibly be. And although he was a bit of a sleazy sort, uh, I certainly could use his $50 a night, so I answered the phones two nights a week for this place. And then you became uh, filled with cupidity. You thought if he can do it and make a fortune, you could set up your own. Well, actually, it was a little different than that. I thought to myself, if he could do it, I could do it, because I was definitely as smart as he is. But he was doing it in such a sleazy, slimy, greedy way. You know, he wasn't treating the girls well. So you were home one night, you had well. a convention of the Biddle Battles, and you said to them, I'm going to start an escort service. It's going to be a high-class one for high-class girls. And men. And uh, men. Come off it. How can you pick high-class men for a Oh, thing it's very like easy. This? When you charge $200 an hour and you only send the young ladies to the best hotels and you're very, very fussy about the type of men who call, it's pretty easy. Yeah, I know, but it's bound to be infiltrated by the orangutans, the guys from the conventions, the boozers, no. the druggy people. No. First of all, they can't afford it. Second of all, they wouldn't appreciate or feel comfortable with the kinds of girls I sent. And third of all, if a girl ever walked in on anyone like that, she was instructed to walk right out and I would pay her anyway. I'm surprised you haven't set up a franchise business for this. You could make really big money <laughs> if you uh, wrote a book on how to run an escort service. Well, that's what this is. Well, no, this is more your story. It doesn't give chapter and verse of how to make a buck at it, does it? Oh, sure it does. Okay, let's uh, stop. You decided, <laughs> you, you decided to run your service. So you went out and you, you said, I'll take you and you and you and you. You'll be my first-class hookers. Is that how you got the girls? No, what we did is we put an ad in the help-wanted section of the newspaper, just like every other business. Saying what? Be, saying one of New York's finest private escort services is currently seeking a small number of well-educated, attractive, uh, articulate young ladies between the ages of 19 and 30 for part-time evening employment. And when they came, what did you tell them? Oh, the truth. Well, what was the truth? To the truth we, was... We presume for a moment I'm one of the girls who answered the ad. I'm merely indulging in hyperbole, but okay, I come in and I say, I'm an intelligent, attractive young woman, and I want to take part in your escort service, and how much money will I make, and you would tell me what? I First of all, you'd look at me down your aquiline nose. And I would say, my dear. <laughs> I would say that, well, by the time we closed, the young ladies were making 175 to 200 What did you tell the girl when she came in? How did you put it in your lovely, high-class way to tell her she was going, you were going to sell her body for commission? Well, if she was someone that I felt that would work well with us, that I was interested in, I told her that uh, we did have some clients who sometimes like to see the girls on a more intimate basis. There was a great deal of money involved. The clients were very carefully screened. If this was something she was interested in, I'd be more than happy to talk about, to her about it further. And you told her she had to go do what the guy wanted to do. 
Oh, no, that's absolutely, no, she never had to do what the guy wanted to do. What do you mean, she never had to she do what She was the never, guy? first of all, she didn't have to do anything with anybody she didn't want to. That's the first thing. Second of all, she was never permitted to do anything more than just straight sex and oral sex. That was all? Right. Anybody who was interested in anything different, we referred them to agencies that specialize in that kind of thing. There are agencies that specialize in unusual. You mean sadomasochistic yes. and all that kind yes. of care? Yes. And how many girls did you um, recruit the first time around? Well, so we only hired about one out of every 40 or 50 that came in because we were so very fussy. And uh, I would say that we normally had anywhere between four and eight girls on a night, except for during our busy season, which is in the fall, we would have anywhere between eight and 12 girls on a night. Holiday weekends and convention time and that kind of thing. Or did you have a regular clientele? Oh, no, we had a regular clientele. How many names in your little black book? I don't know. There were seven of them, only one of which was black, and I'm sure it was many thousands, but I, I mean, never thousands counted. thousands and, and thousands of them. And what, we, what would you tell the girls, though? What about the uh, health? Disease? Absolutely. Absolutely. Did you have them medically examined? Of course we on did. On a regular basis? Yes, on a regular basis. Daily basis? No, a uh, monthly basis. And how much did they get? Out of 175 the girls got to keep 100 Out of $200, they got to keep 120 Did they have to collect the money? Yes, they did. They collected it from the client, and then they paid us the agency fee. And they collected it at the end of the evening, I think it's interesting to note. We're the only business of, of this nature in the world that has ever collected the money at the end of the evening, because I think it's very unfair to treat these men as potential criminals. You know, the minute you walk in the door to demand the money. So you're not breaking a law, actually, in, in selling sex for money. You're breaking, breaking a law for... The parallel offense of pimping or running a body house, is that right? No, the laws are different here than, uh, here than they are in the United States. From what I understand, prostitution here in Canada is legal. The public solicitation of it is not legal. That's correct. More with uh, my friend, the Madame from the Mayflower, the Mayflower Madame, Sydney Biddle Battles. Many times you've been married? None. Oh, and did they all just put you off marriage? Oh, no, no, I just never found anybody that I felt uh, was stronger than I am. I can well believe that. More with <laughs> Sydney Biddle Barrows after the break. Mornings around here consist of doing a lot of things three times. The first thing we try to do is make every morning a Minute Maid morning. And morning never tasted better. 100% pure juice. Every glass has that fresh squeezed taste we all love. Clear up, please. Me too. Me three. <laughs> but me first? Minute Maid, Canada's number one choice in concentrated orange juice. For fresh squeezed taste, make sure. Make it Minute Maid. Grandma. Oh, it must be the Easter Bunny. These are for you. See? They're flowers. Thank you. The Ceramic Easter Basket Bouquet from Teleflora. Fresh spring flowers and something extra. A hand-painted basket she'll treasure for years. And I have something for you, too. A bunny! Teleflora Ceramic Easter Basket Bouquet. You can send one anywhere. I love my gift. Me, too. The softness of a kitten's touch is the soft touch of Royale. They sell Royale bathroom tissue. It's soft as a kitten. Red Sox and Blue Jays. Last week at Fenway, Don Baylor and the Sox kicked him. What's going to happen this time? Toronto, my head says the Sox. Toronto, the, oh, really? Your head says the Sox. My heart right? says Toronto. The Jays battle Boston's Big Bat Sunday, 1.30. They're Ford, they're great, and they're under eight. Right now, you can get top sellers at rock bottom prices from your lower mainland Ford dealers. The Ford Escort, number one selling car in the world, under $8,000. The Ford Ranger, number one selling truck in BC, under $8,000. They're Ford, they're great, and they're under eight. In Vancouver, visit Stadium Motors. I'm quite annoyed at myself just at this particular moment, not keeping up to my normal standard of moral perfection. And I suspect a lot of people will be too with Sidney Biddle Barrows, you know. You're a dangerous person. You think so? I take that as a compliment, thank you. No, I don't. I'm going to give you a nasty question now. Do you really want your daughter, if you had one, to grow up and be enlisted into a prostitution racket, even though you claim to have run a totally clean and perfect racket? 
Well, I'll tell you, there are so many things that I would not want my daughter to do, and I'm sure that this is one of them. But uh, if it was the moral decision of hers that she made, that she wanted to do it, I certainly hope she could find someone as nice to work for as me. But it wasn't a moral decision your girls made. Where did your girls come from? What class of society? Oh, very nice. They were all very well educated. Most of them were in school. Uh, you know, the kinds of clients that we had would not have been able to get along with people from the lower echelons of society. People who didn't speak well, who didn't dress well, who, you know, weren't well educated or articulate. Yeah, but then you relied on advertisements to get your phone calls for your customers, didn't you? Well, how else were they going to find out about us? Yeah, I know, but the point I'm making is that you put an ad in this town for customers for a prostitution racket, and you get some highly disgusting, reputable, disreputable men, some of them diseased, many of them drunks, uh, and how the devil could a nice young woman like you know in advance what kind of clients you're involving your girls with? Oh, it's very easy to tell. It's extremely easy to tell. First of all, when they call up alone, somebody of, of low class like that would say, what do you got tonight? Of course, the answer would be a dial tone. But somebody who called up and said, hi, my name is Mr. Jones. I'm staying at the plaza in room 123. I saw your ad in the yellow pages, and I would like to know something about your agency. You know, somebody like that is obviously a great deal more civilized. You must have done away an awful lot of telephone calls. Extra and a lot large amount of telephone calls. And what about the hotels? Because uh, good hotels in New York, and there are some good hotels in New York, well, I understand, many. don't like hookers hanging around the hallways, do they? No, they certainly don't, and that's why we did such a good business with these hotels, because our girls weren't hookers. And well, they, they were hookers. In. Then I mean, you can't get away they were hookers. What you're saying to me is they didn't look like hookers. Well, you're entitled to your opinion. But I'm anyway, entitled to yours. That's right. But what did you do about them? Uh, well, the hotels knew that the people staying there were going to be calling these type of young ladies, and they would they knew who our girls were, and they would just as soon have our girls in the hotel with no problems, the girls fit in, the customers never complained, rather than, you know, girls that uh, that robbed people or that, you know, stood out like a sore thumb in the lobby. Well, what did you do about their appearance? I mean, we did you have to get, put them through a fashion school of some kind? Yes, as a matter of fact, with a lot of them we did. Because a lot of them, you know, were either in college or just out of college, and their taste wasn't really that well formed. And I used to take them shopping at Saks and would dress them up really very beautifully and very elegantly. See, I think what you've got to remember is what we did is we, we catered to a certain fantasy that a lot of men have, and that's the fantasy of a very expensive, high-class call girl, someone who's very attractive, very elegant, very well-groomed, very bright and well-spoken, and someone who's going to be there for the him, dote on his every word, talk about what he wants to talk talk about, and that sort of thing. And that's if the fantasy that, that these men paid for. Well, you're the only, uh, I was going to say, who else? She'd be mad at that. You're the only escort service operator who's ever, that I've ever had who, who succeeded in doing that kind of thing. To the best of my knowledge, that's true. It is, eh? Now, disease. There is a story in your book about disease being passed around through one of your girls. Well, what happened? Was there not? Yes, there was. And a client gave And you say only girls. once, you know. Yeah, only once it happened. Thank as far God. as you know. Oh, no, I would know. Believe me, they would tell you. <laughs> no, the reason the story is in the book is because it's so unusual for uh, businesses of this nature. You know, in the very lower echelons of this business, there is a lot of disease. But with most escort services, there really isn't. See, I think what people don't realize is that girls who do this kind of thing are so in touch with their mm -hmm. bodies. Plus, they not only know what to look for, they do look. I mean, you know, how many single women or I college students out that. there are looking? If I accept what you say is correct and true, and I believe you, and you've written a book about it, the fact that you had a very special selection of girls. Yes, you go true. to the average bunch of hookers whom I've seen up in court, they're just appalling. Well, there is a big difference. There certainly is a big difference. But that doesn't mean that everybody in this business is like the girls that you see in court. All right, there much, are a you know, different class. Down to business. Yes. How much did you gross in a good year? Uh, I never counted up gross, but I know that my very best year I netted about $50,000. Netted. By the way, when the girl got paid 175, you said, did they take credit cards with them? Oh, absolutely, took credit cards and checks. And when they brought back the checks and the credit card, you then deduct how much? I paid them immediately, and if it was a check for 175, they got 100, and if it was a check for 200, they got 120. And you had rates. What was the rate for what they call in the business a short time? A what? Short time. What's that? Well, there are quick trips. I should be telling you, Sydney Biddle Barrows. There are quick tricks. Oh, we don't have such a sort of thing. We would well, never send a young lady. Not in your high classes. We would never send a young lady to a gentleman who that's, that's all he wanted. $175 would cover the one evening. One hour. No, just one hour. Well, that's a majority, short time. Well, the majority of the clients did keep the girls for two to three hours. That was the average amount. Okay, of and if the client kept two and a half hours, how much did he pay? 
Two and a half, two times 175, That's and then half. 80. Uh, and then she would get how much out? Say 400 bucks, how much would she get? Out of 400, she would get 240, and I would get 160. 160? Yes. No income tax. Well, I told them they should pay it, and I certainly paid mine. I don't know whether they paid theirs or not. Now, you're running a big business, a uh, very big business. So if you grossed, uh, you did more than 50,000. Don't give me that. No, it's true. It would get huge expenses. You can't imagine what the expenses Did were. Did you pay all the expenses? No. Of course. You didn't have to pay for the hotel rooms. Oh, no, no, no. We didn't pay that, but we had, we had an office to maintain. We had extensive advertising commitments, a huge telephone bill. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. And you lived in the headquarters of your escort service? Oh, no, I had my own apartment. I had an office just like it. This was a business, just like every business. We had a health plan. The girls had Blue Cross Blue Shield and uh, Major Medical. Was that covered for that? Of course it was. Self-inflicted injuries? That's what they are. Well, none of the girls ever sustained any injuries. No, no. <laughs> I mean, clinically uh, impeccable. It's a self-inflicted injury to pick up a venereal disease. Well, I guess you might consider it that. I mean, it's Blue Cross covered you for that. Now, there was a time, was there not, when the heavies wondered what you were up to and tried to move in on you? Well, what happened is a greedy landlord wanted his apartment back, and he convinced oh, yes. a vice squad cop who wanted a uh, promotion. They got together, and uh, the cop wanted the promotion so badly that he didn't really look into the allegations that the landlord made about how, you know, the scope of the business and that sort of thing. And thus, he was so embarrassed when the story finally came to light after the bust. He's no longer with the police department. But there was another landlord, or perhaps it was the same landlord, who put nasty notices all over the wall. What did they say of your apartment block? Oh, yes. Well, what, see, the thing is, the police told him that he had to have some kind of proof that we were running this business or else they couldn't arrest us. So he made up signs saying that, you know, that, that, this, that there was this business. Who gave the phone numbers. Whatever it was. No, he just said, finesse and cachet, call her girls, they'll do anything you want, something like that. This is to embarrass you. No, this, this was so he could take it to the police and say, see, she's advertising. She's putting all these posters around them. But then you had some very special instructions for your girls, if I recall, about how quietly they had to enter the building, your building. Well, we didn't want to disturb the neighbors. You know, uh, five or six, eight girls coming in and out of the building every night was sure to disturb the neighbors, and I didn't think that was right. Tell me about when you got nicked. How did you get nicked? That means, in this country, means nailed, nailed. Well, as I said before, the, the landlord and the No, no, no. Vice the charges when you were arrested. Okay, what happened is, is they broke into the office on a Thursday night, and I surrendered myself to the district attorney on Tuesday. And the charges were one count of promoting prostitution, which means that in five and a half years, one person once committed an act of prostitution. That was the charge against me. And I pled guilty eventually after an uh, eight-month court battle because the names of some of my clients were about to be released. And I didn't think that that was fair. You had so to plead I'd... guilty, otherwise your little black books might have been read out in court. Yes. And I didn't think, you know, I thought that even though the business was no longer in business, one of the things that these clients paid for was privacy and discretion, and I did not feel that I had the right to expose them. Oh, yes, and when the girl got the illness from somebody, what did you do? Did you really phone up the customers? Yes, we certainly did. I thought that was the only fair thing So the to customers do. could check with their wives? Well, the ones that had wives. Mm. A full 40% of our clients weren't married. I think it's a, that's a, an incredibly large number that a lot of people find really interesting. And all your clients were perfect gentlemen on all occasions? Just about, yeah. And if they weren't, I told the girls to walk right out of there and I would You never them. had to call the police for them? Oh, never. None of them got beaten up? Never. That's a terrible foul. That, that is such negative propaganda that's been perpetrated we on the public. We had them killed here every year. Not the ones on the street, not the ones working in... I've been thrown off hotel roofs here in this town. Well, I think what most people don't realize is, is the visible prostitution is 20% or less of all the prostitution that's going on. Most of it takes place indoors with escort services, massage parlors, maybe girls who work privately. Maybe with somebody so successful with you, which are, of course, is in universities. How to become a good hooker, how to become a good madame. Doesn't that make you shudder a little bit? No, it's legal here in Canada. I think it is it's not legal here in Canada. It certainly is so. It's, and the act of prostitution itself is legal, but you can't run a whorehouse or a pimp pig service or an escort service supplying girls. You can't do it publicly. You can't do it. They'll nail you far. How are the girls supposed to make any money? If it's a legal Man, business, how are they supposed to get their clothes? It's not a legal business. Prostitution as a business is not legal in this country. No matter what they tell you here, I am right. Because I've this is been your through... show. No, no, I've been through <laughs> this caper. Anyway, you seem delightful, except for the fact that you've got no moral fiber. 
Well, I don't think that that's true at all. I think that these girls have already decided they were going to go into mm -hmm. this business, and it was simply a matter for whom were they going to work, and quite frankly, I think they were better off working for someone who treated them with honesty mm -hmm. and helped them maintain their dignity and their integrity, and I think, and I know that I did that for them. I'll have to call you Madame. Have you retired, Madame? I've certainly retired. The Mayflower Madame has arrived. The secret life of the socialite Sidney Biddle Barrows. Biddle Barrows. Thank you very much. Thank you. The world on a string, sitting on a rainbow. Got the string around my finger. What a world, what a life. I'm in love. Chevron's unleaded gasolines have a new cleaning agent, Tecrolene. It's unsurpassed at cleaning out and preventing harmful engine intake system deposits. It performs so well that all four major North American auto companies use Chevron unleaded gasoline with Tecrolene for their 80,000 kilometer emission systems durability tests. So clean up at Chevron. What? Oh, you could win a trip clean around the world. Clean up at Chevron, your town pump. G'day. When they invited me along to this turnout, I took the precaution of bringing enough of the liquid gold to go around. Ah, ripper. Looks like I did the right thing, too. That stuff looks about as popular as a piranha in a hot tub. It's truth. Must be worse than I thought. Foster's, the golden throat charmer. A deal is not a discount price on last year's technology. A deal is not a rebate on something that's already overpriced. A deal is not the lowest interest rate on something you're just settling for. A deal, a real deal, is the best price you can get on something you want, something worth having. Think about it. If half the things about Frank Sinatra in this book are true, it shouldn't have been written at all. It's such a terrible book. I sat up all night reading every piece of lascivious gossip and attacks on this poor, nice wee fellow, Frank Sinatra. How dare you do this to an American institution? Kitty Kelly. Did you like it? Yeah, I thought it was great. Did you? Yeah. Good. <laughs> but really, how do you get away with it? You, you couldn't get away with it in this country, by and large. How come? Because you've got a Freedom of Information uh, Act and the Freedom Access Act, which we, right. ours don't work so well, and our libel and slander laws are a lot tougher than yours are. I see. I see. Well, it's a good thing that I did it in the United States, isn't it? It certainly is. Now, yes. let's get down to cases. All right. Uh, what interests me most is the efforts that were made to stop you from writing. Tell yeah, me that. That was scary. In 1983, he sued me for $2 million and asked the court for an injunction and wanted to stop the book. Now that was scary because I hadn't written a word. And the publisher, I thought for sure, would back away, but they didn't. Bannon Books stood behind me. But the thing that really helped me was having the support of so many writers groups around yeah, the country. How would he know that you were planning, mind you, you'd already done your book in Jackie O, and you'd done your book in Elizabeth Taylor, and you were a well-known keyhole peeper. <laughs> Am I right? Well, you're right. Wrong? No, you're right. You're right. Spend your whole life peeking through keyholes, don't you? Takes one to know one, Mr. Webster. Well-known keyhole people. <laughs> but you said there was something kind of sinister, was there, in yes. the fact that you... What was sinister about the threatened lawsuit? Well, first of all, it's against the law, really, to do that. I mean, it's a matter of prior restraint to for a public figure to try and orchestrate what the public shall know about him. But the thing that was really sinister during the lawsuit, he said that he had a tape recording of me misrepresenting myself, leaving a message on somebody's telephone answering machine, and his lawyers handed over the tape and we played it, and it was a phony. Now, that was scary that somebody would go to those lengths to do that. It sounded like Boy George. Mm -hmm. didn't, it wasn't me at all. 
That was scary. That scared me. Now let's go down to the gossip. All right, let's go. Let's go to the Kennedys. That's the one thing that I looked for all the way through in the book, because mm -hmm. we weren't so overwhelmed with the hero worship as you were about the Kennedys. Where and how do the Kennedys figure in with Frank Sinatra in the book? Well, Frank Sinatra, now, he really fell in love with JFK. He was a big supporter of Kennedy's, and he funneled a lot of mafia money into the West Virginia primary. And after Kennedy was elected, the mafia expected a favor, and the favor they wanted was to get the FBI surveillance off Giancana. And they sent Sinatra to get that Sam favor. Giancana. Sam Giancana. The big the, mafia figure. The successor to Al Capone in mm. Chicago. Mm. A very close friend of Sinatra's. And they wanted to get the FBI off Giancana's back. That's right. So from there? And they sent Sinatra to get that favor out of Kennedy. He couldn't get it. He asked twice. Finally, Sinatra... You're talking about Jackie Kennedy. Jack Kennedy. Jack Kennedy. Finally, he sent Peter Lawford to the Attorney General, Robert Kennedy, being his brother-in-law, and he asked. He said, please do this for Frank, and Bobby Kennedy said, no, mind your own business. He called the president and he said, you can't stay at Frank Sinatra's house in Palm Springs. You simply can't do it. When President Kennedy said he wouldn't stay at Sinatra's house in Palm Springs, Sinatra cut Peter Lawford out because he was so totally humiliated. He'd spent hundreds of thousands of dollars renovating his place in Palm Springs and wanted it as the Western White House. And that, in the end, really is what brought him around to Ronald Reagan. He despised, Sinatra despised Ronald Reagan during the 60s. Thought he was dumb and stupid. But finish the story about the Kennedys and Judith Exner. Oh, I didn't And mean... Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> Come on. This is the kind of stuff we're buying this book to read about. Well, you're right. You're right. Frank Sinatra is the first one to bring, really, I guess we could say, bring the mafia into the White House. He, after he was through with Judith Campbell, he introduced her to John F. Kennedy. And then he introduced her to Sam G. and Connor, and she had an affair with both men. And when I interviewed her, I asked her if the president knew that she was having an affair with G. and Connor at the time, and she said yes. Well, that's horribly, it's not only sodded, but it's kind of demeaning and worrying about your whole system of democracy, if that kind of behavior can take place at the highest possible levels. You're right. But you paid, paid You're right, this says the best, this is a story about the best and the worst of the American dream. You're right. Yeah. And Bobby Kennedy wasn't involved with them, was he? With He was who? clean. With Judith Exner. No, he wasn't involved with Judith Exner at all. Tell me about Hatpin Dolly, because <laughs> there's got to be something very strange about the Kennedy. You list Sinatra. You list a score of women with whom he had affairs. How do you know he had affairs with all of these people? Oh, I know. Interviewed half of them. And they would tell you? Oh, yes. I mean, for some, it's a badge of honor. For some, they're embarrassed of it. But for most women, it was very, very important to them. Sinatra, ironically, seems like this great sex symbol to both men and women. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't think he really likes women that well. He certainly knew enough of them, didn't he? He did, indeed. Yes, he the did. The one I felt sorry for in the book was Ava Gardner. Now, why did I feel sorry for I Ava? Oh no. Why did you? Why yeah. did you feel sorry for Ava Gardner? Because she... she'd just be one of my idols when she was on the screen, I suppose. And I hated to see her kind of demeaned with all this caper. Demean, she's the one who held her own. She gave as good as she got. There's nothing to feel sorry about Ava Gardner. Who did you feel sorry for among all these women friends? Well, the rest of them I feel sorry for, but not Ava Gardner. She's the one who really called her own shots. She's the one who said, listen, you bum, I can't stand those mafia people. Don't play around with them, don't do this. Oh, she, well, no, I feel sorry for Frank in that situation, not Ava. Oh, well, it you feel sorry for Frank at all because he was well protected by his bodyguards at all times, was he not? He was indeed. Was he a bit of a fighter and troublemaker? Tell me a couple of stories. Well, he wasn't really a fighter, but he'd cause fights. But he was just a poor slum kid from Hoboken, wasn't he? No, he wasn't. He wasn't a poor slum kid. He, uh, he was, his mother made a lot of money. He was never a slum kid. He really lived very well. In fact, the Sinatras were able to buy a house in the midst of the Depression when nobody else could even afford rent. Why did they call a hat pin, Dolly? Because she was. Oh, is that too indelicate a no, question? No, no, I wrote it. I have to. Yeah, you've got to explain answer. it. You're sure. right. Let's get down to it. <laughs> <laughs> because she was an abortionist. And she was an abortionist during the 30s and the 40s. And she was arrested many, many times. But because of her political patri patronage, she never went to jail. Yeah. You ruin a lot of images, though, in this book. No, I don't. I tell the truth. What are you talking about? What do you about? say about Joe DiMaggio? What? I mean, he was he's an all American hero. Yes, he was yes. married to Marilyn Monroe, and you haven't told me about Marilyn Monroe's connections with the Kennedys either. So no, I... let's go to DiMaggio first. How did I ruin DiMaggio's image? Well, we thought he was a great guy, you know, and oh. all of a sudden here he is 
Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. He did have that wrong door raid business, which was... Um, he was very much in love with Marilyn Monroe, and he wanted to catch her in a lesbian affair, and so he got his friends, including Sinatra, to break into this apartment. And they picked the wrong apartment, which is why they called it the wrong door raid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a rather sordid well, piece I mean, of business. Well, I mean, Joe was in love with Marilyn Monroe. Very much, very much. And the thing is, his friendship with Sinatra foundered on that, because Sinatra... Sinatra passed Marilyn Monroe around like a party favor in the 60s, in the early 60s, 1960 and 61. None of this was ever written at the time in the great no, it wasn't. and free United States where you show a lot of lack of consideration for public figures. Mm -hmm. Was it a kind of conspiracy to protect the Kennedys from all this kind yes, of stuff? Yes, I think it was, and that we didn't write about those things at that time. I think Watergate has changed that mm -hmm. a great deal, but no, the president had absolute protection from the press at this time. Now, talk about his relations with the press. I remember the famous case in Australia where he just tore the press to pieces. But he was the same all over the world, was he not? Yes, he was. That's when he went to Australia and called us all hookers and, and uh, pimps, I think. What do you think he would do to you if he could get his hands on you right now? For I don't know. What do you think? I'm not going to tell you. Go ahead. Say it. No, I won't tell you. I don't know the man. Although it's a very believable book, I've got to tell you. Yeah. His way. What a man Sinatra was. Not Shirley MacLaine. Eh? All these names, you know, it's a shame to put all these names of these wonderful people in this book. Kitty Kelly. <laughs> journalist. Keyhole Peeper. Witness the beginning of a new legend. The new 1987 Jeep YJ. The possibilities are endless. Is this a private party or can any store crash? So, Coke, Coke is irresistible. But this is more modern than, 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 than. <laughs> You said the P word. <laughs> so, what I want to know is, if you're drinking Coke, who's drinking Pepsi? You said the P word! If you can't beat it, cast away. Coke. <laughs> Are you fighting the battle of the bulge? Well, here's a shortcut from fat to flat. The original gut trimmer from K5. It's the ultimate fitness machine, specifically designed to help firm and flatten your tummy. Minutes a day is all it takes. Just slip into the stirrups, curl your fingers around the molded hand grips, and gut trimmer turns ordinary sit-ups into fat-burning power stretches. Basic spring-ups work on the upper abdomen. Simply reverse for high-risers that tighten lower stomach muscles. Gut trimmer does all this and more. Stretch your way to a firm back and powerful chest. Trim your waist while firming and slimming problem hips. Gut Trimmer is lightweight and compact. Goes where you go. Great for home, officer travel. Forget about gyms, expensive rowing machines, and exercises you don't need. Nothing fights the battle of the bulge like the original Gut Trimmer. Gut Trimmer, only $19.99 from K5. Available at Eaton's, The Bay, Zeller's, Wolco, Woolworth. I would ask you to make special personal preparations for this section of my program tonight. I wish you to straighten your collar and tie, avoid any profane or loud language, sit up straight, put on a Pune accent if you have one, because I'm going to introduce you to a world of broadcasting which I had never before been seen. Mind you, I've suffered the agonies of the damned in Britain because when they cover a sport, no matter how, how esoteric, it goes on for years. Snooker, night and day for 24 weeks they do sometimes. But little did I know that the most gracious, skilled, intellectual game of all time fills half of the BBC. Now take a deep breath and watch this.
Garry Kasparov, the world champion, who looks like ending the week hanging on to his slender lead against the challenger, Anatoly Karpov. This week, a look at Game 10, a word with Kasparov himself, and later, a long and lingering look at the delights of Game 7, with Nathan Davinsky, the chess historian, and Bill Hartston, the commentator and analyst. He, he almost runs out of moves entirely. That's the only move the knight's got. The king again threatening to come in and invade. It's like a, a doctor who examines you and probes every orifice and potential weak spot from your brain to other places. And you have to protect yourself at each time. Oh, yeah, well, Karpov's having none of his orifices uh, attacked here. It seems almost very slightly disappointing, Nathan. Disappointing? Mm. No, I think it was a great victory for Karpov. Uh, with the black pieces, he's had a lot of trouble. Terrible trouble. This is the first time he actually was never in... Well, it was on the brink, I admit that. But he actually got full equality eventually on move 44. <laughs> Karpov's reply just came as a surprise to everyone. That's an astonishing move, Nathan. It puts him back with his entire king's side undeveloped. What was the reaction of the grandmasters and the crowd down at the hall? I have seldom met so many grandmasters and masters saying out loud, we have no idea what's going on. It really was an interesting thing that all this chess knowledge in the room, it was like an encyclopedia of experience all hopelessly confused by what was going on on the board. They had one thing in common. They felt that White had an excellent position. If you don't know Fisher or Spassky or Korchnoi or Karpov or the delights of black and white power or the dreadful reference to orifices, let me introduce you to Tuzi Davinsky. <laughs> Doozy, I didn't know you were a chess master, but before you, shh, quiet, please. Let me put it this way to you. How does a, a quiet, mild-mannered, discreet, totally unknown, tenured maths professor at the University of British Columbia, a failed alderman of the lowest order, could not get re-elected, was wiped out by Harry Rankin on a daily basis, and now all of a sudden, you became the darling of the BBC. What have you been hiding from the people of British Columbia? All my life, apart from mathematics and a few other side issues, I have taken a profound interest in chess. Mm -hmm. It has been filling me up slowly over the years. Until now, I feel like a ripe cactus. And in London, with the weather being what it is, a flower bloom. <laughs> it bloomed so much that I have here an historic collector's item sold for large money by the BBC. It says, we love Davinsky. I mean, I nearly fell. I mean, I know you, you know. <laughs> I, I appreciate your robust sense of humor. They must have fallen over backwards when you said you were going to examine, probe every orifice of something or other. It happened this way, Professor Jack. After the first program, the producer of the program, which has always, up to then, been very dignified. Well, you know more about that. You, you essentially come from the British Of course, audience. and I am very dignified. <laughs> oh, yes. And the producer came out of his soundproof room at the end to the closing music of Prokofiev's Romeo and Juliet, screaming at the top of his voice, we've never had a program like this before. <laughs> and they were about to cut important parts of my body off when a phone call came from on high. Perhaps there was a Canadian good fairy or a relative of yours mm -hmm. who appreciated the earthiness of the Western Canadian culture and said to this producer, with the sharp knife already out, we like him, keep him. And you, became, you were an instant star. An instant star. How many broadcasts did you do? Five on the chess program, mm -hmm. a morning breakfast spot, two on the corresponding uh, Jack Carson show, and a lot of radio work. 
from the World Service to the CBC by satellite. Now, just wait a moment. Let's start at the beginning. Yes. You were, of course, <laughs> being a tenured professor, having a delightful sabbatical at public expense in Europe at the time, were you not? I had just finished a most difficult research paper, <laughs> which I had sent off to the Hungarian Mathematical Institute, having been there in Budapest with my new BMW. <laughs> and... <laughs> Dave, when did you get the new BMW? I bought it at the factory in München, Munich. Munich. Yes. You see, there are some benefits of going on sabbatical. Never mind. You're, you're somewhere, and you finish up where is it, Montpellier? Yes, I went down to Montpellier because classes hadn't quite started yet. And my friend Boris Spassky was playing. There. Spassky! Spassky! Now, Not I'm, the great Spassky! Not the great Boris! The man who was beaten by Fisher! Yes, very bad. That dreadful American! Well, I know Fisher well. He reminds me a little bit of you. <laughs> <laughs> he just wrote a pamphlet saying how the Los Angeles police had beaten them up. However, Boris was in Montpellier playing, and he has, at 48 or 9, become very quiet, the old grandmaster. And whenever a young, fresh person offers him a draw, he says to me, I do not have in my heart to beat the hell out of him, so I accept the draw. And his results have been very mediocre. You were disappointed in I Spassky. went down there and I said, Boris, no more draws. When was the last time you won a game of chess? And he turned bright red to match his Soviet flag. And I made it an arrangement with him, and I helped him analyze, and he did much better. You said no more giveaways. No more. He was playing, and I could see the person in a, in a difficult position saying, would you like a draw? And Boris almost said yes, and I caught his eye. And I went, hmm. <laughs> you know how to deal with world's champions. Absolutely. And from there, though, lead me to the... Well, then the BBC wanted to interview him, and he said, why should I interview with the BBC? And I said, it might do me good. I have some friends there. So he gave them a brilliant interview. On the opening credits, you saw him pulling his nose and going like that. Was that Spassky? That's Boris, yes. And he gave them an interview, and I got to know them. And so they asked me once on the show. Mm -hmm. And that's when the producer came out screaming with a sharp knife. And after that, I became a regular. Ah, but I want to hear more about you becoming a regular and the cues of media dancing in when nobody here will talk to you in town after the break. What break? You see them everywhere. Work time. A drinking box at work time. Rest time. Any time's the best time. And it's all because of the fruit. The fresh taste and goodness of fruit is McCain's number one priority. Bye, Mom. <laughs> drinking box, drinking box. The fruit makes the drinking box, drinking box. Hi, folks. I'm Martha Ray. You know, I was never embarrassed about coming on TV and telling people I wore dentures. That's me. Tell it like it is. And now I'd like to tell you. There's a brand new polydent for us denture wearers. A super strength polydent. Look, a mean food and coffee stain. Now my new super strength polydent. It has more cleaning power than ever. Gets mean stains cleaner, even in between. I think every denture wearer should use it. Tell me true. How is your baby feeling blue? Thinking that maybe something's gone wrong. Take, take care, take care of your baby. Budget break and muffler nose breaks best. You'll get fast service, friendly prices, and a lifetime plus guarantee for as long as you own your baby. Let them baby your baby, yeah. These guys have become country legends. Hello, Mary Lou. This group is solid country gold. This album is Country Supergroup, 17 of the greatest country groups of all time. Alabama, Restless Heart, Bellamy Brothers, Sawyer Brown, Exile, and the Forrester Sisters. Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. The only album of its kind anywhere. Country Supergroups from Quality Records. Where did the cameras go? 
I've been on the BBC so long, they don't have any breaks. Well, we have, we have class commercial breaks. But back to the point, after the secret committee in the top of Broadcasting House said, let the man go, what was the demand for your services? They were lining up behind me. NBC, Italian television, Dutch television, Tunisian television, <laughs> some little guy from the Royal Jordanian Chess Association. <laughs> I almost said to him, I'm Jewish. <laughs> they were so nice to me that the producer began to take me into his confidence on the program. Not like this show where everything is staged and I have to do only what you tell me. And I said to him, why don't I do walkabouts? In my head, I was thinking of, who's that guy in Vancouver? Webster is his name, Webster walkabouts. So they let me do walkabouts. We got a hold of the building before the game started and I went to the board where they were playing and I sat in their chairs. Now they had different chairs made. Kasparov had a stiff, hard chair because he would jump up and stomp the stage. <laughs> and he's a very aggressive little cocky 23 year old. I want to kick him in the rear. The other chap, Karpov, who's a mature 35 year old, had one of these lounge chairs and he could hide in it sort of. Behind the stage, we had to build two toilets. One that said Kasparov only, and the other said Karpov only, and they had to be identical, mirror image. So I had the BBC cameras with no commercial breaks. We went down into the bowels of the toilets, and I showed the toilets, and I said, this is where their vital juices start running. <laughs> and they cut it out. Didn't they? They wouldn't show it on the Absolutely no taste whatsoever. These two chaps, Kasparov is the young champion, 23. His name is Weinstein. Weinstein. Yeah, he's there with his mother because the old man Weinstein ran off. She's a beautiful lady. <laughs> and I got to interview him. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, can you imagine that when you're my age, computers will be able to beat you? <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, I cannot imagine ever being your age. Tell me, what about uh, the skills today? Fisher, he was a funny guy, Fisher. Spassky. They were both great players. They... What makes a good chess player? A mathematician? No, brain? no, it's pure talent. There are many mathematicians who think they know how to play chess. They don't really play very well. It's talent like music, like being able to run a talk show. Like mm -hmm. upper class drafts, checkers. Checkers? You know what I mean, dominoes. Yeah, but computers have solved that. Com dominoes? <laughs> He is talked out. You know, we may be the odd couple, and I'm not sure which one is which. Which is which. But maybe Laurel and Hardy would be better. One of us is over with. How old are you, 64, 65? I am 60 and a half. I'm much younger than you. I want to talk about how to interview people. What the hell did you learn in a matter of a couple, a month? Both Karpov and Kasparov are very shy. They're also very arrogant. Mm -hmm. And they only meet interviewers who say, we don't know anything about chess, you're a genius, you're wonderful, and they're fed up with that kind of psychophantic... Behavior. Behavior. Psychophantic. And, and I have heard that while I was gone, mm -hmm. your bite has diminished. And in fact, I watched you with our Prime Minister Mulroney the other you day, and you treated him with so much respect. That is a damnable lie, and coming from a man who gets $100,000 a year for two hours <laughs> teaching a week, the same old calculus, turning over the page, the same old drawings, and all you do to your students, I know this is, don't, you say to students, don't try to work this out for yourself. Believe me, it's true. Is that, is that not that's your That's when the proof is very difficult. That's your teaching and, technique. That, that's a very good You tell me I was I not. discovered something. I got to know the KGB people. Oh, <laughs> how well. <laughs> <laughs> and they arranged that I could interview both Karpov and Kasparov. And they're very reticent and they're very careful 
because everybody is watching. And I started to interview them, and I would ask them questions, and they would hold forth, and I would contradict them. On chess technique? On anything and everything. I treated them barely as an equal. If only you'd learned that in city council. That's true. I was mesmerized by your friend, Rankin. You were a weak, uh, smarmy little man in council. I was not little. <laughs> <laughs> so you learned that anyway. And I, you demolished them. And I wanted to pass this piece of information on to you because I got superb interviews out of these reticent, non-English speaking, arrogant stars. Through an interpreter? No, through me. Russian. I watched you 10 years ago when you had bite. And I want that bite to come back. Well, you've been a veritable joy and a delight. I have revealed to a couple of hundred thousand people in British Columbia and on the satellite round the world that this mild-mannered little useless alderman had within him the germs of brilliance. Cactus flower. And you could have been a Spassky yourself. Mm, I would have had to give up music, bridge, mathematics, Shh, quiet, please. My eternal thanks to Nathan Davinsky, commonly known among his friends as We Toozy. And I'll be back after the break. most famous collection of fine French wines, like Prince Blanc, Cuvée Special, and Beaujolais Saint Louis. What's in today is out tomorrow. But I prefer the things that never go. Like the taste of a Mars bar a day. It gives me what I want at work, rest and play. They're Ford, they're great, and they're under eight. Right now, you can get top sellers at rock bottom prices from your lower mainland Ford dealers. The Ford Escort, number one selling car in the world, under $8,000. The Ford Ranger, number one selling truck in BC, under $8,000. They're Ford, they're great, and they're under eight. In New Westminster, visit Fog Motors. If you could guess the asking price of this home, or this townhome, or this home, if you knew the asking Here. price, then we would pay off next month's mortgage or rent on your home. We're AM 1040 Radio. Radio that pays your mortgage. AM 1040. Listen to win. I hope you enjoyed Kitty Kelly and Sidney Biddle Barrows and Nathan Tuzi Davinsky. I chose them because I thought you would enjoy them for a change of pace from the normal Webster type programming. I'll see you Monday, 5 p.m. precisely. <laughs> Here's the fabulous Atlantic B-Mop with its built-in remote control ringer and thick special dripless sponge head that always stays soft and absorbent. Your hands never touch the water. To wring it out without bending or straining, just pull up the lever. And now, in addition to the interchangeable B-Mop head sold separately, comes the new Queen B-Mop, 28% wider for all those heavier cleaning jobs. Also available, the Shaggy Duster with telescopic handle and the Shaggy Dust Mop with flexible handle. Two other fine Atlantic Bee products designed to ease your cleaning chores. Sold everywhere. One of the world's most demanding test tracks and the 1987 Suzuki Samurai 4x4. Hi. It's taking the uh, straightaway test. It really goes straight. Maneuvering into the 
Uphill test. Downhill test. Now, the all-important brake test. Let's brake for lunch. Turning to the off-road test. Juggling test. But potato salad test. What's the world-famous Metropolitan representative up to now, Charlie Brown? He wants to make sure people know that Metropolitan offers individual life, group life and health, RRSPs, and retirement plans. What's he got in mind? Good grief. Spectacular. Get met. It pays. Sam started running. Not marathons, but he is taking things more seriously. And so am I. I buy more fruit and skip the cookie aisle, and I've switched from mayonnaise to Miracle Whip salad dressing. It has 39% less fat, 30% fewer calories than the leading mayonnaise brands. Plus, Miracle Whip has that tangy zip, and Sam takes that seriously, too. Make a change for the better to Miracle Whip. Sugar Ray Leonard's fight with marvelous Marvin Hagler. It's here Sunday at 4.30. The News Hour with Tony Parsons. Good evening. With word that there are many secret ballots about to be cast by a host of unions in this province against the new labor laws. Also tonight, the country's biggest oil exploration company appears ready to fall into foreign hands on a global...